morning, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining the ICES lecture titled India's Friend, Japan's Enemy, Japan India's Special Strategic Partnership. This lecture will outline the significance of the Japan India Special Strategic Partnership while looking at the two countries' contrasting views on the war in Ukraine. The lecture will also explore what the future holds for the Japan India bilateral relationship and the implications for broader regional and global politics. We are delighted to have with us as guest speaker, Professor Purnendra Jain, visitors, Visiting Senior Research Fellow, Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore, and Emeritus Professor, Department of Asian Studies, University of Adelaide, Australia. Please note that the session is being live streamed on ISAS Facebook page. I now invite ISAS Director, Associate Professor Iqbal Singh Sivya to deliver the opening remarks and chat the interactive session with Professor Jain. Professor Sivya, please. Thank you, Divya. Good afternoon, Professor Jain. Thank you. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Institute of South Asian Studies, or ISAS, I would like to thank you for joining us for this morning's panel discussion titled India's Friend, Japan's Enemy, Japan-India's Special Strategic Partnership and the Russia-Ukraine War. India and Japan share a rich bilateral relationship today. This is perhaps reflected in the apparently strong personal bond that existed between Prime Minister Narendra Modi of India and Japan's former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. The latter not only visited India a number of times, but also articulated a geopolitical and geoeconomic vision which prioritized relations with India and was also strategically aligned with India's developing position in the Indo-Pacific. This was visibly articulated by Prime Minister Abe in the famous speech, Confluence of Two Seas, that he delivered in India's parliament in 2007. And as a historian, I cannot refrain but to point out that incidentally, the, um, the title of this speech is a phrase that is borrowed from a famous 17th century Mughal prince, Dara Sheko, who wrote the text known as Majmao Bahrain. Um, and this translates into confluence of two oceans or the mingling of two seas. And this text by Dara Sheko essentially argued for the unity of different religious traditions. More, um, in a similar way, in his speech, Prime Minister Abe also quoted from other Indian figures like Vivekananda, um, arguing for pan-Asian brotherhood. So I think this is something that we probably will be discussing as we look ahead as well. Since this speech in 2007, India-Japan relations have evolved significantly against the backdrop of China's economic rise and expanding influence within Asia and the shifting dynamics in the new ge geopolitical theater of the Indo-Pacific. Both Tokyo and New Delhi are members of the Quad and are, dealing, uh, and are developing closer relationships with, um, with Washington. It was, of course, Japan under the leadership of Prime Minister Abe that initiated, the, initiated and reinitiated the idea of the Quad. Um, in fact, in, in a, number of, um, a number of Indian commentators actually refer to Prime Minister Abe as the Quad Father uh, in, in regard to his, uh, his leading role in the Quad. Prime Minister, uh, present Prime Minister Fumio Kishida has further stressed the role of the Quad in securing a free and open Indo-Pacific. In a similar vein, India has also emphasized the idea of the free and open Indo-Pacific and is actively participating in initiatives and working groups with fellow Quad members. Various discussions and partnerships have been forged in the areas of vaccines, climate change and technology. Both sides also recognized the potential for further economic relations between Tokyo and New Delhi. Notably, India was the 18th largest trading partner for Japan, and Japan, the 12th largest trading partner for India in 2020. Both countries are developing active cooperation on AI technologies among their top um, research institutes. It remains to be seen how the launch of the Indo-Pacific economic framework will impact India and Japan trade and investments. In the post-pandemic world, Japan and India also face significant challenges to boost their economic growth and build resilient supply chains against the backdrop of rising US-China competition. Today's discussion analyzes the future trajectory of this bilateral relationship, taking into consideration historical factors and contemporary restraints. As the title of the talk indicates, Professor Jane will also discuss the impact of the Russia-Ukraine conflict on India-Japan ties. 
there is a clear difference, and I don't want to pre, uh, preempt anything that's going to be said, but I think we, for most of us it's clear that there is a clear difference in the public statements issued by New Delhi and Japan with regards to criticizing Russia. Our guest speaker, Professor Jane, is a visiting senior research fellow at ISS, and it is a great pleasure to have him because he is one of the premier experts on studying Japan and one of the leading voices to analyze um, South Asia Japan relations. So it is with great pleasure that I hand the floor to him. And like you all, I'm looking forward to hearing his views and engaging everybody in the discussions that will follow. So Professor Jane, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, very grateful being affiliated with ISAS. Um, today is my last day here. I fly out back <laughs> to Adelaide where I live. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Iqbal uh, for hosting me at the Institute. Um, great to meet him. And I have renewed my acquaintance with uh, some of the colleagues here. Um, we have got uh, Amitendu, um, Yogesh, um, and others. And great to see a great uh, group of researchers here and uh, staff who are able to support us in various ways. I also acknowledge uh, the presence of dignitaries here, uh, excellencies, uh, thank you for coming along. Uh, it's early in the day, uh, 10.30, uh, so that makes all the more uh, difficult for everyone to uh, you know, come to a presentation at 10.30 in the morning, so much appreciated. So as the director has already mentioned, you know, today Japan's India engagement it stands on solid ground. There is absolutely no doubt about it. Its future course looks positive owing to a number of factors, both domestic and external. And within domestic, I would like to emphasize leadership factor, which is very important. We do a study in foreign policy analysis about the role of leaders. Uh, not so much in the realist tradition, but more in, in foreign policy analysis. We do um, emphasize the role of leadership. And here it will become quite obvious. But at the same time, I would think the gloss and optics that were witnessed when Shinzo Abe was Japan's prime minister, that looks fading a little bit. Um, the personal touch of, as uh, Dr. Iqbal mentioned, uh, the personal touch of Abe, Modi, and Bonomi, uh, that is missing at, at this stage. I think this has to do with the transition from uh, Shinzo Abe to Yoshihide Suga, and then from Suga to Mr. Kishida within a year. So we are witnessing again a period of revolving door prime ministers in Japan. That was the situation between 2006 and 2012. Um, hopefully, as a Japan specialist and analyst, I don't want to see that uh, uh, repeated this time. Uh, so hopefully, uh, Kishida will uh, stay a little bit longer. So while domestic circumstances and leadership change are factors, external developments and India's response to them have also caused a bit of disappointment or even disquiet in, in Tokyo. Uh, RCEP is one example with India's withdrawal at the last minute. Um, Japan was very, very uh, you know, disappointed, uh, to put it mildly. Uh, but I think now the current uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine and the war in Ukraine has created a bit of fissure between Tokyo and New Delhi, which is not obvious, obvious to everyone. Uh, but that is a, a truth, that is a fact. So how that is going to impact, I will come to that point. So in this presentation, what I'd like to do is to just make some introductory points with regards to the war in Ukraine. I'm sure all of you know, but just to recap those things. Then I present a quick survey of the strategic uh, or the status of uh, Japan-India relations in more uh, current times, maybe last uh, 10 years or so and Japan and India's different trajectory of relationship with Russia, because that is the focus of my talk this morning. And then the impact of, on, on the bilateral relationship as a result of this 
um, disconnect uh, to a certain extent and what might be some broader implications. So let me move to those four points. So for, first is we all know that the uh, world is quite divided on this um, uh, war in Ukraine and Russia's invasion in, in, um, yeah, to, in Ukraine. And this, is, this division is not as clear cut as, the, as during the Cold War. So the, in, at the time of the Cold War, the lines were clearly drawn and everyone knew who belonged to which side. But in this case, uh, there is division, but these lines are very, uh, they are not very uh, clear. Uh, sometimes we think here in terms of binary democracy versus autocracy, which is, in my view, is a bit simplistic way of looking at the complexities of, of these issues. Uh, the division is evident across the globe, in Africa, in the Middle East, and Asia, of course. So ASEAN, for example, since we are here in Singapore, um, ASEAN, for example, as an organization, is broadly, in my assessment, sits on neutral ground. Of course, Singapore has a strongly condemned Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, and voted in the UN uh, against Russia and support the US and Europe in, in this, on this issue. But if you look at other countries, Vietnam, Laos, Thailand, you know, you have different perspective on these things. Or Brunei, for that matter, or Philippines, uh, you know, they have got different perspectives and they have got different approaches to this issue. Um, in, in a sense, one could um, make a very simple narration and say that uh, while Europe uh, is united, Asia is divided. Uh, so uh, Europe, along with the United States, you see a great degree of unity, which perhaps we haven't seen in recent times. But we see a great degree of division in, in Asia, whereas we talk about the Asian century, getting together, talking to each other. All those things are happening, but you see a great division on this issue. But this might be a simplified narrative of Asia divided, Europe united. It's a kind of slogan which I perhaps made. Um, but deep down, the problem and challenges are much complicated, and the binary argument is a difficult one to sustain. Countries are often divided on some issues, but such agreements do not stop them from interacting with each other and cooperating on other issues. And here, to illustrate this particular statement, I would like to uh, you know, uh, introduce the contrasting views of India and China on the Ukraine war, that they have contrasting views and yet they, they cooperate quite deeply. And I don't see how that cooperation is going to dissipate because of this particular factor. It might create, as I said, a bit of disquiet in Tokyo, a bit of disappointment in Tokyo about it, but that relationship stands on firm ground and it will remain on that firm ground. So India and Japan, some uh, quick points. Uh, look, you know, uh, it has been said many times, but uh, I repeat, uh, that no two Asian countries develop their relationships so far, so deep, and kind of wide ranging, as did um, India and Japan in the last 15 years or so. <coughs> And I say this because, uh, because of the nuclear fallout in 1998 with India and with Pakistan as well. Uh, but after 2000, we have seen a rapid progression in, in the relationship. So ties have a strengthened leading to greater uh, attention of the relationship in the IR community. And because I am a kind of Japan expert, sometimes I am dubbed as area specialists. <laughs> but I see there are lots of IR, mainstream IR as scholars uh, getting involved in this. You know, this India-Japan business used to be a cottage industry in the 1970s and 1980s. It has become a mainstream industry now. So you will see lots of com commentators and analysts from the IR, from economics, and from other disciplines trying to analyze India-Japan relations. When I did a book on Japan and South Asia in 1995, 
uh, you know, no one thought that this book will be will get any attention because there was nothing happening between Japan and South Asia. But I think now that book is quite widely <laughs> read. So uh, anyway, so they have a strengthening their relationship uh, quite substantially. Uh, there are numerous bilateral declarations, agreements, and dialogue processes. Um, and the relationship with Japan and India, they also have now formed uh, plurilateral uh, frameworks, including, of course, the Quad is the, the most obvious one there. So my, my point is that this relationship has developed quite fast, but the gravity or the center of this relationship has been in the strategic and defense areas. Other areas, economic, economic uh, relationship, uh, cultural, people-to-people -people contact, they are still pretty much underdeveloped. Um, and I will tell you why economic relationship is, is uh, underdeveloped. So there is a lot of potential, and this potential political leaders have been talking for the last 15, 20 years. But I haven't seen that potential being realized in actual terms and in actual data uh, when you see them. So the argument which I'm trying to develop here is the bilateral relationship remains strong, although one can see a degree of trepidation and absence of intensity uh, post Abe. But how this relationship moves forward is not just what Japan does, but it also matters what India does and how India uh, adopt, adopts and adapts. Uh, so that is very much, uh, it will depend on both sides. Uh, briefly, very uh, quickly, I can see the trajectory of India-Japan relationship if you talk from at the end of the war in 1945 or when India became independent in 1947 and Japan became independent in 1952 after the, Jap after the American occupation ended. I see a peak in the relationship in the 1950s between India and Japan. Then I then this relationship dips very, very, it goes down the hill very fast to the lowest point, almost to the lowest point in 1998. And then it starts to build up. That is the third phase, building up. The fourth phase, I see another peak appearing. If we graph it, we can see that clearly. But I, I, I don't know you understand what I'm saying here. From peak to the lowest point, to build up to another peak. And now, in my view, it has stabilized. It has stabilized. Uh, whether it's going to go up from here, down from here, as I said, it depends. India, Japan, how they interact with each other, and what they find common ground between these two. So 2000, uh, it was the beginning after the nuclear fallout in 1998, when Japanese Prime Minister Yoshiro Mori, he went to India. Uh, no one thought much about that time because, you know, Mori was another, uh, you know, uh, 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 revolving uh, door prime minister. He lasted for one year. But I tell you, this man is very, very powerful in the LDP, is still around and is still very powerful. Uh, although his prime ministership was limited. So let's not uh, uh, look at or think about Japanese leaders just because they were a short-term prime minister. The internal politics is very complicated in Japan within the LDP and how the factional politics works in Japan. So Mori is a kind of um, uh, a doer, and uh, he shakes and moves things uh, within the LDP. Anyway, so that, that was a side story. Uh, then uh, Atal Bihari Bajpai, who was prime minister around uh, 2001, he visited uh, Japan in, uh, as a, um, as a uh, res response to Mori's visit in 2000. But actual things began to happen um, around 2006, 2007, just before Abe became prime minister. And uh, Dr. Iqbal has already mentioned about the confluence of the two seas. You know, the, the writer of Abe's speech, Mr. Taniguchi, he was tasked with this thing. And he has told many of us uh, that he was at pain as to how to frame this, which will have a kind of impact and bring Abe on the global platform through his, um, through his uh, speech in the Indian parliament in 2007. So he did dig out this uh, Dada Shiko thing 
And he then connected that to the, uh, not religion as such, but he connected that to the two seas, that is the Indian and the Pacific uh, Oceans, which ultimately became Abe's uh, flagship uh, idea of the Indo-Pacific and then free and open Indo-Pacific. So that was Abe's uh, contribution, which took um, India on a very different level in relation to India uh, relations with Japan and Japan-India relationship. So as you said, the, this is marked uh, by uh, strategic and, and defense uh, relationship. If you look at this, I have got a list of things here. Japan-India Comprehensive Security Dialogue in 2001. Joint Statement Towards Japan-India Strategic and Global Partnership in 2006. Joint Declaration on Security Cooperation in 2008. Bilateral 2 plus 2 Dialogue at junior ministerial level in 2010. Upgraded to the ministerial level in 2019, the most recent being uh, held this year in Tokyo. Uh, annual Defense Ministerial Dialogue. Agreement on transfer of defense equipment and technologies. This is very important, that Japan has agreed to transfer e defense equipment and technology uh, through this uh, agreement in 2015. And all three branches of the military, of course, Japan does not have technically a military, what they call the self-defense force. Uh, but this self-defense force consists of all three branches of the military in a different name. Uh, so all these three branches, Indian and Japanese, they um, have interaction on, uh, on each of these branches. Uh, India, Japan, they have lots of naval exercises. They are also part of, of course, the Malabar uh, exercises on a permanent basis in, from 2015. Uh, more importantly, I think, uh, India and Japan signed an acquisition and cross-servicing agreement called AXA. And uh, this means reciprocal provisions of supplies and services between these two countries. Uh, it's, it's a huge development between India and Japan. If you look at Japan's signing of this AXA, that is only with US allies. Uh, so Japan has signed with Australia, Canada, France, UK. India is an exception. So you will see lots of exceptional things happening in India from Japan's perspective. And that makes us um, uh, you know, think that how important this uh, relationship has become. Even they mentioned a joint fighter air for aircraft exercise in 2019. Hasn't happened. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, maybe not. Maybe yes. Uh, also of note is that India has allowed Japan to get involved in lots of sensitive areas. And here I'm talking about India's Northeast, where the Japanese have come and spent uh, ODA, Official Development Assistance of Aid Money, to develop road and connectivity in that area. But we all know how sensitive uh, you know, that is from India, India's strategic uh, perspective. And also, Japan is involved in developing uh, uh, some monitoring and surveillance uh, uh, processes in the Andaman and Nicobar Island uh, groups. India has never allowed any other country to go in, in those areas, but it has allowed Japan. So we can see a degree of trust as well between these two countries. Uh, but there have been some you know, issues like you know, Japan has been trying to sell or India wanted to buy uh, what they call uh, amphibian aircraft from Japan, which is very, very well regarded and it's a very effective amphibian aircraft. Uh, negotiations went on for maybe 10 years, but it never happened. Uh, the Japanese and the Indian sides, they've got different stories. Always when things fail, you hear two different stories, but who to trust, I don't know. But the, the, the result is that it didn't happen. Last month, uh, a report suggested that there, will, there is a possible export of stealth antennas uh, for naval ships to India, particularly for destroyers. Uh, whether this is going to happen, I mean, this was discussed at the 2 plus 2 meeting, uh, actually just a couple of months ago in Tokyo. 
Uh, if realized, this will be first export uh, under a Japan-India agreement on defense equipment and technology transfer. So now let me not spend too much time on it. Um, uh, let me move to the, uh, the Russian aspect of it. Now when we think, uh, talk about Russia in the context of India and China, uh, the relationship with Russia is complex for both Japan and India. Each has followed a different path. Uh, in the case of Japan, post-1945, and for India, from the 1950s. Uh, context here is Japan's security treaty with the United States and its membership in the Western Club. India's context is its non-alignment and its variance, uh, strategic autonomy, or multi-alignment, and so on and so forth. For Japan, Russia is its neighbor on the northern side of, uh, on the northern side, and the two have not signed a peace treaty following World War II. Technically, they are at war. Technically speaking, they are at war because they haven't signed a peace treaty. Um, so through the Cold War, of course, Japan perceived the Soviet Union as a threat. In the post-Cold War period, and with the change in Russia's political regime, prospects of a peace treaty emerged, especially after Gorbachev's visit to Japan in 1991. This was made possible through deep engagement initiated by then Foreign Minister of Japan, Shintaro Abe that is Shinzo Abe's father. But negotiations faltered, dragged, did not progress. Now more recently, one of the key missions of Prime Minister Abe, now the late, uh, and as we know, longest serving Prime Minister of Japan, was to find a solution to the territorial dispute with Russia. And to that end, he held more than two dozen meetings to be precise, 26 meetings with uh, his Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin, until 2019. In the end, though, it came to naught. Nothing happened. The situation remains what it was back in 1945, or a bit of negotiations which happened in the mid-1950s about fisheries and so on and so forth, but nothing on the territorial issue. India, on the other hand, has been um, I don't need to tell this audience here, <laughs> a close partner of the Soviet Union slash Russia, uh, strategically, economically, especially, you know, purchasing Russian arms. So the Soviet Union, Russia, is stood by India on many difficult occasions at the time of wars with neighbors, and particularly in the UN. Uh, whenever India needed, Russia voted with the United, uh, with, uh, in favor of India. So like two decades uh, ago, they, they signed a on a strategic partnership. Um, and on his trip only last week or uh, two weeks ago, uh, External Affairs Minister Jashankar called again Russia a time-tested friend. And uh, he have a lot. And he did uh, justify buying oil from, from Russia in the name of India's national interests. Russia was the first country which, with which India established an annual summit process. Uh, Japan was number two. Now, our Japan was the second one. So both with Russia and Japan, India has an annual summit process that is between the heads of government, between these two, uh, with, with the leaders. Now, the Ukraine war, um, in the wake of this Ukraine war, the relationship turned, what should I say, uncomfortable, maybe, uncomfortable, uh, between Japan and India because of their vastly different responses to it and their interpretation of this war. When the Russian forces began to march in Ukraine in February 2022, Kishida, Prime Minister, decided to stand firmly with the United States and Europe that is also NATO, as well as with the G7. Even at the risk of possible diplomatic breakdown with Russia. So he took that calculated risk very, very, uh, uh, you know, cal in calculated risk consciously. Um, but Japan's, because Japan has got great energy interests, apart from the territorial issues, Japan has got energy interests. 
And Japanese companies have invested in Sakhalin projects in oil and gas, which is, which, by the way, Japanese have not withdrawn. It's still continuing. And um, I mean, look, Russia is not a huge part of the energy mix in, in um, uh, Japan. Australia is number one supplier of LNG to, um, to Japan, followed by Malaysia, Qatar, and Indonesia. So Russia is number five for Japan. The Russia-China alignment, uh, together with nuclear-capable North Korea, makes Japan, in Japanese assessment, a vulnerable nation. And we can see why the Japanese will have that kind of assessment in security terms. So, but despite strategic threats from three nuclear powers in its neighborhood, uh, Japan decided to stand what it refers to on the principles of a rules-based international order and against any unilateral change in the status quo. And of course, in solidarity with his ally, the United States, and key uh, partners uh, in Europe and um, elsewhere, including Australia. Uh, Japan drew a parallel between Russia's invasion of Ukraine with the strategic situation in the Indo-Pacific. And that parallel is about China's design in Taiwan and its implications for Japan and the broader region. This has ignited a, the debate in, on the nuclear issue and its importance in Japan. You know, Japanese are very sensitive towards any nuclear matters. Even uh, nuclear power plants, there was a lot of sensitivities attached to them. Uh, but when it comes as a nuclear power, a nuclear bomb, you know, they are much more sens sensitive. But there is kind of debate now undergoing in Japan, not very, uh, not uh, so much in the newspaper, but uh, is undergoing about whether Japan should go for nuclear sharing, as some European nations do uh, with the United States. Whether that's going to happen, we don't know yet, but that's a kind of debate going on within Japan. But we know that India has not endorsed Japan's view of a parallel between Russia, Ukraine, and China, Taiwan. India has not drawn into, into that debate at all. Uh, you know, Japan has taken some very extraordinary steps in support of Ukraine. Uh, apart from financial support and aid, Tokyo has provided military-related equipment uh, from protective gear such as bulletproof vests and protective masks to drones. Uh, this is very uncharacteristic of, of Japan, but it has taken that decision. Interestingly, public opinion supports Kishida's tough stance on the Russian-Ukraine war. A Kyodo news uh, you know, poll suggested 73.7% of Japanese support tough economic sanctions against Russia. Anyway, since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, this is another quite an extraordinary development in Japan. The refugee averse Japan has accepted more than 2,000 uh, people uh, fleeing the conflict and provided residency, work permits, and social services to help them assimilate in Japan. A rare and surprising move. I, I tell you why rare. Japan has so far in its history has accepted only 915 asylum seekers in the last 50 years. So to have 2,000 uh, displaced Ukrainians willing to come to Japan and Japan, welcoming them with open arms is something uh, quite remarkable. Where well, Japan did very little for Afghan uh, uh, displaced people from Af Afghanistan, even some of them while they were working for Japanese NGOs and for Japanese mm -hmm. embassies and so on and so forth. Now, India's response has been vastly different, I, I, we all know. Uh, of course, Russia is a long-term friend since the Soviet era. Uh, Moscow support, as I mentioned, at the UN uh, has been very uh, important um, as an arm supply to India. And, um, you know, uh, so India has uh, consistently abstained. Uh, 
at the UN, uh, General Assembly, Human Rights Council, and has not directly condemned Russia on this issue. So for India, of course, Russia is a security provider, uh, not just through the sales of arms, which of course uh, are massive. Um, you know, Russia has not allied with or armed Pakistan. Uh, and that, you know, this, this Pakistan picture comes, uh, you know, the Pakistan factor comes in the picture uh, very clearly. Um, you know, Pakistan leaders have been trying to move uh, Moscow, uh, Imran Khan. Uh, he was in Moscow in February 2022, if I remember. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, Shahbaz Sharif um, met, uh, uh, yeah, uh, the Russian leader um, on the sidelines of the SCO very recently. So, so India's departure from Japan on this issue, and indeed from the other two core partners, US and Australia, plus the co collective West, with whom India has forged close partnership recently, has surely created some fissures between India and the core partners, collective West, uh, Japan included. To me, there is a bit of a logical fallacy here. And this logic that India adheres to a rules-based order and opposes unilateral change in the status quo, especially by force. The logic that India would support these principles in the Indo-Pacific region, with China as the main concern, but won't internationally, especially in the case of Russia, is difficult for Japan to really uh, fathom out of this particular um, reasoning. So the official position we know of India is this national interest, supplying of energy at, the affordable, uh, at an affordable price to its population, and so on and so forth. I think most importantly, though, I'm not a great expert on India's strategic uh, orientation, but uh, India would hate to see a strong Moscow, Beijing, Islamabad nexus. That is not in India's interest. So it would try and avoid that uh, situation. And for that, India's preference is to keep Russia on its side. So now let, let me just uh, uh, quickly wrap up. Uh, so we need to look at what might be the impact of, on India, on Japan's relations with India on their differing views uh, and how they might affect uh, the bilateral relationship. The three Quad partners have more or less, in my assessment, have more or less accepted India's position. Uh, they, they would like to, uh, for India to be more explicit uh, on, on these issues rather than being implicit. Um, but I think they have accepted and they want to work around uh, this uh, situation that India is not going to uh, you know, condemn Russia uh, directly, except in some veiled, very you know, hidden way of uh, maintaining peace and law and order, and international law and international order, and so on and so forth. So they have accepted this position. So for the time being, it's the same uh, business as usual, India's relations with the Quad members, as well as with, uh, of course, with Japan too. Um, uh, because I think Japan, together with Australia in particular, and US uh, as well, they understand the critical role of India in the Indian Ocean, uh, particularly. Um, you know, India is uh, quite sig a significant uh, naval power in the Indian Ocean. Uh, recently commissioned its homemade aircraft carrier, Vikram. So they understand the uh, importance, strategic importance of India. And of course, India's role as a balancer against China, a country of concern, perhaps now threat, to all Quad members. Um, so following Japan, Australia also pursues, since I live there, and work there, I thought I will bring Australia here. Australia pursues really deeper defense engagement with India, and it wants to enhance its defense relationships with uh, 
with India quite significantly. The, the, uh, and that's why I think there is what I would call a bit of a strategic tolerance. Um, uh, uh, the Quad pa partners, they understand India's position, so they want to, you know, uh, they, they, they accept what, where India is coming from. In Japan, uh, the good point is that there is a bipartisan consensus in, in Japan to continue building its relations uh, with India. Um, whether it is the LDP, which has ruled Japan for most of the post-war period, or when the opposition party, the DPJ, or the Democratic Party of Japan came in power, uh, 2009, 2012, they were equally uh, focused on India. So I see a very clear bipartisan support um, in Japan uh, for India. So I, I can't see, I don't see any, uh, you know, uh, the relationship uh, being derailed uh, on, on this issue. I just said there is a bit of feeling of uncomfortable and maybe discomfort, uh, but not necessarily to the point where they will uh, start pressing India on, on something. And they also, of course, understand uh, India's economic potential and its huge market, very attractive, especially when they are thinking in terms of decoupling uh, with China. India obviously comes as uh, an alternative market, uh, uh, for Japan and for other, we know, the United States and other Western countries. But I must here add a footnote that uh, not, not very much has happened or is happening in the economic field. If you look at Japan's India trade, it's quite the same level of Japan-Russia trade, which is like, you know, very, very small still despite the fact that India and Japan signed a CPA in back in 2011, 2012. So it has been quite a bit of time, but the needle has not moved much on that. Investment, maybe a little bit more than before, but not to the extent which, if you think about India as a potential big market and compensate for China, we haven't seen that kind of thing in India. And as you said, it has, lot to do with India's response. Um, Chinese, Japanese have been a little bit careful with the Indian market. They burned their fingers several times, so they are very, very careful business people. Um, I think the absence of Abe is felt around the globe to a certain, but more so in India, because Abe batted for India bring cricket here a little bit. Mm. <laughs> so I have I been batted for India like no <laughs> others. And I can't see in Japan there is a leader who will bat for India the way Abe did. Uh, he had some inherent um, goodwill towards uh, India because he always he wrote when he wrote this book in 2006 towards a beautiful country, there he mentioned um, how he heard about India sitting on the lap of his grandfather, Mr. Kishi, who went to India way back in 1957. And Kishi brought all the uh, you know, positive um, images of India, which he narrated to Abe. And somehow those things got stuck in Abe's head, and that, that persisted for a long time. So that, that's, a, that's an issue at the moment. And uh, you know, as I said, Japan was a little bit disappointed with the RCEP, a uh, bit kind of disappointed with uh, consistently India's narrative of India's uh, national interest and why should not it buy oil and why it should not condemn Russia uh, because of its national interests. Um, there is a bit of disquiet in Tokyo. Just to conclude, um, I, I saw a, uh, a survey here done by uh, UGov Cambridge Center Globalism 2022, not very uh, long ago. In this, um, you know, who is more to blame, Russia, no, don't know, both, neither, or West? 
So if you look at Japan, 67% of Japanese, they blame Russia, right? Uh, Australia around that much, 70%. So Australians and Japanese, they are on the same pace towards their perception of this Ukraine war. But if you look at India, it's only 27% who, who say that Russia is at fault. Um, so that tells us a lot about India's view of Russia. And it's not just the government. I get the impression that people in general in India, as this uh, survey would tell us, they are, they, they, they like Russia as a friend, right? And it's hard for them to blame a friend. So that's why only 27% in India. And this is quite recent, actually, September 2022. So it's just a couple of months ago. Uh, not even a couple of months. Yeah, a couple of months ago. So I think on that note, I uh, end and very happy to have a dialogue or <laughs> interaction or engagement with you. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, um, Professor Jain, for that um, comprehensive and insightful um, discussion. I, I believe you've given us a lot to, to chew on, and um, I'm sure there'll be a number of questions and, and debates and discussions. Um, I just want to just want to point one thing out, right? One correction to you. You started the talk by saying this is your last day in ISS. I just like to correct this, that this, for this trip. This yeah. time, this <laughs> I just time. wanted to. <laughs> Last time, this time. I just wanted to correct I should, that. I should have added. Yeah. Yeah, this time. So this I thought. I thought. I, no. Be be warned. Yes, right? yeah, yeah, be yes. warned. Thank you. You will be back. No, no. So, <laughs> I look forward to that. Yes. Um, maybe let me just um, start by asking some. I have a few questions, but I'll just throw one, one or two general sort of framing questions to to start with. Um, drawing from your 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 very rich discussion. I, I wonder if I can ask you to speak a little more about um, Japan's vision for the Quad post um, Shinzo Abe um, and how and if and how uh, India's resistance towards any kind of formalization of a security alliance structure um, impacts Japan's own positioning within the Quad. And, and related to this um, is a question that a lot of us have been grappling here as well is, how much of buy-in is there to this new geopolitical construct of Indo-Pacific? And I ask that in relation to the fact that in ASEAN there is some discomfort with Indo-Pacific and mm -hmm. still uh, longing to, to view the world through the Asia-Pacific lens. Yeah. So just to, to, to start the discussion, those. I think, uh, you know, the current prime minister is trying to create um, difference in his foreign policy uh, and differentiate himself from Abe. Uh, he lived in Abe's shadows for a very long time. He was Abe's foreign minister for five years. And, but, you know, Kishida comes, I was talking about LDP's mm -hmm. faction. Um, Abe came from a very different faction and Kishida comes from a different faction. And these two factions historically have been one, this is, which was Abe's, now it is called the Abe faction. And they are still kind of fighting as to who will be the leader of that faction. And that is the largest faction within the LDP uh, parliamentarians. They have got about 99 members out of 300 odd members of parliament. Uh, so the Abe faction is essentially a hawkish faction. Uh, they believe in revising the constitution, settling post-war account, um, you know, less dependency on the United States, uh, and so on and so forth. Whereas Kishida comes from a faction which is dovish. Uh, their, their idea is to have some kind of balance between the US and China in particular. And uh, they, 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 they are not particularly in favor of uh, amending the constitution because their belief is that Japan should remain a pacifist state, uh, so to say. But I see there is a bit of change in Kishida's orientation 
on these issues. So he's coming closer to Abe's views. Not exactly replicating, but coming closer to Abe's views. And as we know, the quadrilateral was kind of Abe's idea. Uh, he, he initiated this in 2006 when he became prime minister. It never uh, got, got off the ground uh, because of several reasons, and we all have written something about that. It never got off the ground, but uh, when it uh, did um, come to fruition, uh, Quad two, or in his uh, resurrected uh, form, uh, then, of course, uh, Japan um, and Abe was there uh, still. So uh, they are very much the thing that uh, this is Japan's creation, and uh, Kishida is very much in favor of this squad. Uh, when it comes to the question of India, I think um, you know they they accept that India has got India doesn't want to make it a security alliance kinds of things. And I don't think the Japanese are particularly concerned about it because they have got their security ties with the United States. And with Australia in particular, their ties are becoming very strong. If you look at recently, they have signed Australia and Japan, they have signed the RAA, uh, which is the Reciprocal Acquisition Ag um, Agreement. Um, so it means now they can uh, exchange their militaries. Uh, the SDF forces can come and train in Australia, and Australian um, forces can go in Japan and train. About, apart from US, no other country has got this kind of arrangement with Japan. So we can see Australia and Japan become. So because Japan knows it's so strong in with the US, is becoming very strong with Australia. So the core, they will not necessarily push this idea that it should become a, a kind of security type of, of course there is an element of security into it about the whole Indo-Pacific idea, you know, uh, the Indian Ocean, defend, defending the Indian Ocean, uh, law and order, you know, open seas, all those kinds of things. So. I think the Quad will continue in its present form, and we know that India has embraced the Quad uh, quite well. Uh, they are no longer resistance to this idea of the Quad. So that leads me to your point this, this you said about the Indo-Pacific, right? Uh, I see Indo-Pacific being expanded a little bit, and I say this because I see what's happening in the South Pacific at the moment. So originally, the Indo-Pacific was not about the South Pacific. But I can see how Japan, Australia, and the US are going to blunt uh, China's presence in the South Pacific uh, region. And they are already, I mean, the, the, uh, the new government in Australia is very much up to this project. And they are talking lots of things at this stage. Uh, so the Indo-Pacific is a kind of it's a rubbery concept. <laughs> what you include, what you exclude is not clear. You know, uh, Europeans have got their own Indo-Pacific uh, uh, orientation. Uh, the British have got uh, something with Indo-Pacific. The French, in particular, have got. Um, ASEAN, of course, um, has got an outlook in Indo-Pacific. So it's a very rubbery concept. I think it will keep evolving and changing. But the core will be, I think, the Indian Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, and now it includes the South Pacific um, in a big way. So I can see um, South Pacific not directly, but indirectly included in the bigger or broader uh, concept of Indo-Pacific, free and open. I mean, free and open is problematic. Yeah. Uh, all kinds of adjectives are attached <laughs> to that. If you hear Biden, he has got different adjectives. Mm. If you hear Mr. Modi, he has mm. got different adjectives. So adjectives yeah. differ. They keep adding adjectives. But I think the key is that the Indo-Pacific is something which has been embraced um, by you know, major players in, in this area. 
The floor is open to questions now. Um, I'll, I'll go around the room um, according to the hands that are raised. But could I just request that you um, just introduce yourself before before you ask your question? Uh, I can start with him. Okay, okay, I'll start with Karthik first and then. Um, thank you so much, Professor Jain. Um, my name is Karthik Nachif and I'm a fellow here at the Institute. Just uh, it was a very interesting talk and discussion. Um, um, on Japan and Japan's um, strategic interests and, and views. I have a couple of questions. First is on the Japan-India side. Um, you mentioned that the, the Japanese government was unhappy with India over a number of issues. You mentioned RCEP and and I think there was another issue that you mentioned. Were there any qualms? The Ukraine war. Ukraine, is. yes, the Ukraine as well. Yeah. Were there any qualms from the Indian side on Japan over the years? on specific issues? Were there reservations, issues, concerns that New Delhi had with Tokyo and how it moved on on various matters in this part of the world, you know, you know, through the Quad, uh, whether it was with China, with SDF? Um, were there other, other Indian, Indian qualms or reservations over Tokyo? Um, and also on the economic side, I'm sure there probably would have been a little issue, some concerns there. The second thing, I was really fascinated by your discussion on Ukraine and on, and on Japan-Russia relations uh, and how they've been affected um, through the Ukraine crisis. Because we seldom hear about Japan-Russia relations and how Japan responded uh, to the war in Ukraine. Because we hear a lot about India and, 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 and the US and its allies. For, for, for some reason, we don't really hear much about Japan. Mm -hmm. So I'm really happy you went and went a little bit further on that. Thank you, um, ISS, for hosting me. <laughs> yeah, so the, the, the question I had there is, I mean, so, so Japan followed U.S. and U.S. allies in imposing sanctions on Russia and being quite hard-lined. Do, do you think Tokyo missed an opportunity there um, to use sanctions or to use trade with Russia as some sort of leverage to resolve its own territorial disputes? Um, or, or was there any discussions there in Tokyo to do that at, at any point over, over, over the last six to eight months? Um, yeah, thanks. Shall I? Yeah, please. OK. So uh, your first question about whether India has had any qualms about Japan. Um, I can't think of any. I mean, for a long time, India was very unhappy with Japan not recognizing India's nuclear status. Uh, that was a big issue from India's side. And the Japanese were not willing to give in on that issue. But ultimately, they decided. So Japan and India, they signed a nuclear, civil nuclear agreement in 2017, if my memory serves me right, around that time. So that called. Uh, or that concern from India's side gone very easily and quickly. Uh, the Indians have been uh, negotiating on this US uh, two amphibian aircraft. Uh, there was a bit of um, unhappiness on the Indian side because it was not progressing. Uh, but as I said, if you hear the Japanese side of their story, they have a very different story. But I wouldn't consider that as a big issue between the two countries. Um, and I don't see, I mean, of course, India wants more investment, greater trade, better access to the Japanese market. Uh, but these things are, for some reason, they are not progressing well. Um, I, I just can't offer any analysis at this stage, but the point is that the Japanese market, although open, they have got very strict regulations. And sometimes uh, Indian exporters, they don't comply to those uh, strict regulations. Uh, so, but if you, again, you hear the Indian side, they have a different story about the Japanese market. Uh, but the long and short of it is that has not progressed. Investment, yes, but you know, if you look at the Japanese, number of Japanese companies, uh, in India, about 1,200 or so companies. They have grown up quite significantly in the last six, last six, seven years. But I don't see lots of investment going into India. When, we, when uh, Japan decided to encourage Japanese companies 
to move away from China and come to Japan or go to other countries, very few of them chose to go to India. Almost none. Mostly they went to Southeast Asia. Vietnam was, and some of them, they went back to Japan. Um, so that, that's the situation. But there is, a, as I say, you know, they, they always talk about potentiality of, of these things. So there will be. Um, ODA uh, is a major thing. Um, I should mention that Japan went um, all the way to provide more than $10 billion of ODA to India. Japan has never done that even to China when uh, Japan was supplying lots of ODA to, to China in the 1990s, 80s, 90s for this bullet train project between Mumbai and Ahmedabad. So ODA for sure, um, but investment, bit of improvement, and um, trade, little, but the Indian side always is telling us that the Japanese are very difficult to deal with. Um, so of course, I keep telling them, because I study Japan, I said if Vietnamese can deal with them, and uh, you know, other Southeast Asian nations can, Singapore can deal with them. Why India finds it so difficult to deal with Japan? So I don't, I don't understand that logic. Uh, but I must say in the, you know, kind of, that there are very little disagreements between India and Japan. There is a whole, huge goodwill. But when you see the actual outcomes, they don't show for themselves. And that's a puzzle. It's a puzzle which could be answered. It's not, it's not something which cannot be untangled. Sorry, I'm being a bit brief, but that's <laughs> my response, Karthik. Yeah. Oh, sorry. OK, so you said so Japan's view of uh, Ukraine, Russia, uh, what could I mean, look, you know, as I said, the, the Japanese government, Kishida, took this conscious decision. And it will be a cost to Japan, absolutely, there is no doubt about it. The territorial negotiations will remain in deep freeze for a very long period of time. That's not going to. Uh, if Abe, after 26 uh, rounds of negotiation, could not reach anywhere, I don't think any prime minister would think that they should restart and can get somewhere. But what surprised me a lot, the way the Japanese have accepted with open arms Ukrainians. I think at the back of their mind, the China-Taiwan issue is deep down their head. They think that if we let it go, then something will be repeated in Japan's neighborhood. And so they wanted to send a strong signal um, to Russia, to a certain degree China, and but a stronger signals to its friends and allies that Japan is really concerned about you know, what might happen in the Taiwan Strait. And that was the reason Japan responded to the way it responded to the Russian invasion in Ukraine. Okay. I've seen a number of hands. I'm going to go in the sequence in which I, I noticed them. So I'll start with Imran. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sorry. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Jane, for such an um, insightful talk. I'm Imran, one of the fellows here at ISAS. Um, the question I had was basically, uh, you mentioned, you, you talked a great deal about India-Japan uh, relations sort of developing fast uh, and deep uh, quite quickly. You also mentioned the nuclear fallout of um, 1998. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, a little bit curious to know how, how that played a role. Uh, and also sort of how, what, what is uh, Pakistan-Japan relation uh, relations like, and has that sort of played a role in um, 
uh, I guess, shaping uh, India-Japan relations. Okay. Thank you very much, Imran. Um, I see Imran very often at breakfast in Kenville, <laughs> <laughs> but we never <laughs> had this discussion. Um, yes, I think the nuclear fallout, that was the lowest point, as I said, in Japan-India relationship. I mean, Japan was brutal in terms of its response towards India. I remember Jay Shankar was in Tokyo. I had a discussion with him. He was senior diplomat in Tokyo. Uh, um, so it was quite uh, brutal. I mean, the Japanese um, uh, put sanctions. They withdrew lots of um, events and interactions and at the defense level, at different levels. So it, it became quite nasty, actually, in 1990. But India was not the only one, with Pakistan uh, as well. And I will come to that question about Pakistan. Um, but I think with the US uh, changing its attitude towards India, that prompted Japan uh, to think India a little bit differently. One would think, can, you can draw that conclusion. But I have read an interview with uh, Mr. Mori. Uh, then uh, he was prime minister in, in 2000. And, and he was the first who went after this nuclear fallout to India. In this interview in Japanese, it's not widely circulated, but I have mentioned that interview here and there in my writings. So he said that he himself could see the strategic importance of India. It was not just the United States, right? So in other words, the Japanese were already thinking about deepening their relationship with India. But this was totally unexpected for them. You know, uh, so they, they didn't know what to do except to react in a very harsh manner uh, because they did not anticipate this thing at all. But the, Correction course started very, very quickly. U.S. certainly is a factor, but if you, uh, you have to believe what uh, Prime Minister Mori has said in this interview, he said, and he said, look, you know, I was very much interested also in India's IT sector. Uh, the joke going around that Mori said it rather than IT. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, so he was very much interested in the IT sector, what was going uh, happening in India, so he wanted. He went to Bangalore uh, uh, during his um, trip. Now, coming to the Pakistan question, um, but this began to like uh, dilute uh, slowly, gradually, as the West and uh, the United States began to deal with India on this issue, had nuclear agreements and so on, and so forth. Uh, so the Japanese. Uh, but it's still insisting for India to sign the CTBT. That is one of the things which they have been consistently telling India, that India must sign the CTBT. Uh, but anyway, as I said, in 2017, after a long time, actually, India, Japan then signed this nuclear agreement, long time after others had done, right? On the Pakistan question, it's very, it's very interesting. Actually, I have written the little essay for the newsletter on Japan and South Asia, just 1,000 words. Um, but you know, Japan's unspoken policy was to treat India and Pakistan equally. If you look at Kishi's first visit in 1957 to the subcontinent, he went to Pakistan together with India. No prime minister since Kishi has gone to India alone until Abe in 2007. So every time a prime minister, will, Japanese prime minister, will make a visit to India, they will make sure that they go to Pakistan and maybe some other South Asian countries together, but certainly Pakistan. So their, as I said, their unwritten principle was that they treat India and Pakistan equally. Of course, India was very iffy and unhappy about this situation. They wanted to change that pattern, that India should be treated at, at, at its own rather than always linked with Pakistan. 
And then we see the 1998 nuclear uh, testing, both in India and Pakistan. I think Japan responded to them equally at that time as well. If we talk about Japan-Pakistan relationship today, I think that is the weakest link in Japan's interaction with South Asia. And the reason I don't want to say, because that's in the <laughs> newsletter, which I want everyone to re read. <laughs> uh, but one of the reasons is Pakistan being so close to China. And, and uh, so that, that is uh, something which uh, Japan um, cares about. Uh, so China is a factor. Um, and also Pakistan's own political instability and other political factors, uh, they have led uh, Japan's very low level interaction with Pakistan. If there are two other countries in South Asia, I would think Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, these are the two other countries besides India with which Japan um, you know, interacts uh, closely and would like to deepen, deepen its relationship with both Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. But Pakistan, India relationship. I mean, look, you know, I don't think any prime minister from Japan has visited Pakistan for a long time. Mori was the Mori, Mori, Mori. No, I think Koizumi went. I, I, but since Abe, no prime minister has traveled to Japan. So that's the Japan-Pakistan situation at the moment. It's, it's really weak. Um, some aid money to Pakistan, a little bit of investment, not much, actually, in Pakistan. Thank you. Okay. Abhi Tendov. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Punendra, I, uh, I wanted to bring you in into a context uh, which I thought was quite interesting. And uh, this partly connects to the response that you gave to Imran and where you end it. You know, it seems, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it seems that uh, for a very long time, uh, Japan looked at India from a purely bilateral perspective. Purely bilateral, that this is a country with whom there is a, a lot of historical goodwill, a shared history, there have been mm. lots of uh, you know, good things that have happened culturally otherwise. But India will remain a committed friend. We will also be with India. But economically, uh, there would perhaps not be as much of a commitment to India as you would see Japan forthcoming with respect to certain other partners. I think for a long time, the relationship went on like that. And there was the G7 way of looking at India. There was the OECD way of looking at mm -hmm. India, to all of which Japan participated. And there were concerns over uh, what India might be doing with respect to climate, uh, sustainable development, and so on and so forth. But over the last five to six years, it seems, there has been a change. And uh, I, I'm not sure about... Uh, a large number of other factors which have contributed to the change. I, I'm sure the geopolitics has. Mm. But what I now see uh, Japan uh, beginning to do, and very noticeably, is looking at India as a very, very important partner for building its roots deeper in South Asia, a part of South Asia, and the Bay of Bengal region. Mm. And uh, I think this is very well reflected in the kind of Japanese engagement that is visible in Bangladesh. So this is, in fact, uh, no country other than Japan has actually committed so much to Bangladesh, even before Bangladesh has graduated out of its LDC status. They are into deep sea port, they are into aviation. Sumitomo is building the mm -hmm. first special economic zone. But the interesting part is that all of these appear to be based on the assumption that the India-Bangladesh relationship has become exceptionally strong mm -hmm. and the economic framework behind that engagement is very robust. There is, say, let's say, for example, the, the uh, shipping agreement which has happened between India and Bangladesh, which Japan has been very quick to support and respond to. Uh, there is also the BIM stake, uh, 
on which Japan has kept an eye in terms of what is going on. And you mentioned Northeast. Mm. So I think that element of the connectivity is also very strong on the Japan perception. Would I be correct in saying that now uh, what we are actually getting to see uh, from Japan is a much more uh, comprehensive outlook towards the South Asian region, or at least the eastern part of the South Asian region, and where Japan clearly sees uh, India to be its most important ally in uh, pushing forward a series of you know, very long-term economic engagements, including the supply chain, including the connectivity. So does that, in a sense, mean that uh, there's going to be some sort of a qualitative change in the way Japan and India engage economically now? And I'm mindful of the fact that Japan, since India's exit from ASEP, has not talked trade with India. It doesn't talk trade with India anymore. It talks about connectivity. It talks about skill development. But it doesn't talk trade anymore. So I think there's probably this understanding it might have come from Abe himself that stay out of the bits which are troublesome, but focus on something or some things mm. which can lead to deeper long-term benefits. Do you think that this kind of a mindset has uh, arisen in Japan among the policy establishment? Thanks, Amitendu. Yeah, <clears throat> great. Um, look, you talked about uh, Japan, India, and South Asian countries' relations bilaterally, uh, not much multilaterally. Uh, I can take you back a little bit. You know, the Japanese, again, they looked at uh, ASEAN and the way Japan was able to engage with ASEAN and countries of ASEAN. So when SARC was proposed and SARC came into being, the Japanese got really excited about it. I remember, I mean, this is kind of going back 20 years, 25 years back into history. They were very excited about it. But SARC almost fell apart, mm. right? Uh, it has become almost dysfunctional. So one platform through which Japan could have engaged better in South Asia, they thought that that was not possible now. So it remained bilateral, essentially bilateral. And for a long time, Japan had you know, concerns about India's economic um, policy. If you look at APEC 1989, you know, Japan was against this idea of ex including India into APEC. I mean, Indians wanted to be part of APEC. So did Australia, mind you. Australia also didn't want. Paul Keating was totally against this idea of bringing India into APEC when he was prime minister then. But you are right. I mean, the Japanese are looking at different ways of engaging South Asia through India and strengthening its relations with India. And uh, this connectivity uh, in the Bay of Bengal, in particular, through. Um, but I, I get the sense in Japan that they are still not sure the relationship between Pakistan and Nepal, uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh, Pakistan and Sri Lanka, they go kind of yo-yo, uh, becomes better, becomes worse. How, where there is any consistency in the pattern of the relationship with Japan and its neighbors. So that is huge kind of in the back of the mind, back of policymakers' mind in Japan. I could only read their observations that don't say, you know, you know, in black and white terms, but I can see that there's a bit of... But this geoeconomic uh, aspects uh, could be quite um, attractive to Japan, and the Japanese are trying to do that. If you look at even Japanese investment in India, like when I say the Japanese have concerns about India, the bullet train project, the Prime Minister of India Modi, he insisted that I want this project to be completed by this time. And the Japanese were very like, how we are going to do it, you know, like. But 
Now the Japanese feel very frustrated because things are not progressing the way it, they were supposed to progress. So they question sometimes India's capacity and capability in absorbing uh, Japan's aid, just bilaterally, but they are even more concerned when it becomes multilateral. How India relation, India's relationship with work with Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. Because those countries also, depending upon how, what the political, uh, you know, who is in governance and government in those countries, uh, it depends their relationship uh, goes, um, you know, up or down. Uh, but I think your, your um, framing of this, of Japan getting involved in multilateral is correct, but we haven't seen much in a big way happening uh, yet. Um, so Japan kind of keeps its bilateralism gives that bilateral orientation a little bit uh, more value to it rather than engaging on multilaterally on that part of the world. Of course, India engages, uh, Japan engages India multilaterally in the Quad, in lots of uh, trilaterals, for example. But in the South Asian region, I think that's still quite, in Japan's mind, problematic. That's my assessment. I may be uh, wrong on that, but that's my assessment. Have I, I talked? I, I think yeah. I've seen um, three hands. Um, so perhaps, um, would you mind if I take the questions no, yeah, together? Sure, sure. We started a few minutes late. We'll go over by a few minutes, and I'll consolidate the questions. So I've seen Yogesh's hand first, and then I'll come around and say yes. Uh, Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Jan. Uh, I really liked how you connected the domestic politics, the intricacies of it to, you know, Japan's external relations. So I have, I have two questions. Uh, this whole lecture, in a sense, and the empirical st stuff which comes out of it, gives me an idea that if you actually create a graph of Indo-US relations and create a graph of India-Japan relations, they will actually overlap very nicely. Mm -hmm. uh, and in some sense, the Indians kind of understood it after the 1998 tests. So they went after the US for the nuclear status and then went after the Japanese and the Australians. And until and unless they sorted out their nuclear status with both Japanese and the Australians, their strategic relationship with both Australia and Japan kind of lingered in some sense if, you know, uh, if that is, uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, on the other hand, if you, when you look at how India wants Japan in Asia, it does want it to be much more independent. You know, whether it is, and in, in a sense, that create that genuine multipolarity. And that has actually happened in 1964, 65, when India, Japan actually started their first strategic dialogue. And the, the only cohesive element in that is the emergence of China. In 1964, after the Chinese nuclear test and how the Japanese felt about it. And even today, in the last one decade of 15 years, in a sense. Uh, so this is, the, this is in some sense a problem as well, because what would India like Japan to be? Would it like it to be as aligned with the US? You know, and pragmatically it makes sen sense for India. Mm -hmm. But would it want Japan to be an independent actor, much more militarized, possibly nuclear maybe tomorrow, you know, to act as much more independent and create that genuine mul multipolarity? And I think the Indians kind of think on both these two aspects very, very, uh, uh, you know, there is, there is a lot of thinking on that. Uh, the second thing, uh, so w what would be your, you know, assessment in a sense of where, sh where India would like Japan to be? Uh, the second thing, I think the Ukrainian crisis is a benchmark to kind of look at, and, and this has happened everywhere in a sense, you know, uh, whether it is the West, whether it is US allies, uh, in, 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 in Asia or the Quad members or so to say, uh, India's geopolitics and geography is very, very different. You know, in a sense that there is an asymmetry of interests. Uh, we cannot compare how India would look at Ukraine and compare it how Japan would look at India in a possible confrontation with China. And India enjoys that asymmetry of interests, vis-a-vis -vis the US as well as Japan or any other Quad countries. 
And therefore, you see that, OK, even when you know, we are not, OK, we are not fine with India, but then we will also go along with India. Uh, so does India use that asymmetry of interests vis-a-vis -vis China? And that's, that, does that work for India? Well enough that even with these, you know, and major, it may be a major issue for the US, maybe a major issue for Japan, but until and unless the lowest common denominator remains China, India is in a comfortable position. Mm. You know, so how does that square up in some sense with the Quad and all that? Thank you so much. Can I go to Sandy? Yes. yes. Uh, the mic. Um, uh, yes. You, yes, Sandy. And I think actually it's a super great summary, perhaps, of what he was asking. Mm -hmm. uh, you started off talking about how leaders are truly leaders are truly most impactful on inter-country relations, right? Abe particularly. Perhaps just asking you to gaze into the crystal ball and talk a little bit about super superfluous to a leader, the idea of external circumstances also being the huge other thing that forge ties between countries. And you, you've mentioned Taiwan, obviously. And um, uh, Ganesh? Thank you, Professor Jen, for a very comprehensive, very insightful talk. Of course, most of it was really about strategic affairs, but I really want to, which, which of course was what was needed on, at this time. But what I was hoping to get from you is also is to really persist with what you said about the economic side of the story. Uh, so the puzzle that you mentioned, you know, that enormous reservoir of goodwill uh, going back to the work of the ODA in setting up iconic projects like, I mean, one is the India International Center in Delhi. Mm -hmm. The bridge which connects the two parts of Delhi, the east and the west, east and the, the other side to the central Delhi, which uh, the Japanese built very early on. And I think I think it needs, we need to remind ourselves that the huge impact of Maruti, you know, because it came at the time of the when liberalization was being talked about, mm -hmm. uh, pre-liberalization period, but created a huge goodwill, a, sense, a constituency for reforms, which uh, do, came with the car ownership for the Indian middle class. So I think it had a huge impact, and the enormous reservoir of goodwill which was created for Japanese corporations. And all that remains unleveraged. So this puzzle, of course, you said cannot, can, needs to be explained. Uh, I'm wondering if a kind of answer might lie not so much at what the Japanese state is doing, but what Japanese corporations are doing. So is there any reluctance on the part of Japanese corporations to expand their presence? Um, uh, because the same players have been there, Toyota, Hitachi, all those players have been there. But in some ways, they are losing out. Uh, am, I, am I correct in saying they are losing out to Korean corporations like Samsung? Kia, Hyundai, uh, in India, in India, More in the Indian market. So yeah. that's one one yeah. way. Is there? Can we get an understanding of uh, m maybe there's an insight to be gained from looking at firm level perceptions of India as a market and as a place to do business? Mm -hmm. uh, finally, is there a sense that the Japanese are taking a more calibrated view of the Indian market in terms of identifying, just as Singapore has done over the years? and looking at particular states, doing business with those states where they feel comfortable, where there is a more, uh, where there is an ecosystem, more friendly um, ecosystem for ease of doing business. Thank you. Could you have five minutes? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I thought you were <laughs> Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I think no to you. Okay, thank you. Okay, Yogesh, thanks very much. Um, yes, I mean, I agree with what you said about if you plot and look at the graph, it could look quite you know, similar. But my response to that is, you know, Abe's, this Indo-Pacific and mingling of the two seas, that breaks that pattern clearly. Um, so I don't think Abe was trying to follow the United States on that. So he was genuinely convinced that India is a country to which Japan has not paid attention and we need to pay attention. So that mold is broken there completely. It's not, nothing to do with the United States. Um, and if you 
believe what Modi had to say in his, you know, interview. Um, he, he, he said that, yes, you know, he went after Bill Clinton, but, you know, his, he, his interest in India was real. It's not just he followed the United States. Uh, but that uh, na narrative is quite strong, and rightly so, that you know, Japan follows lots of stuff what the US does. Of course it does follow. And that brings me to your question of India's expectation of Japan being uh, more independent in its foreign policy. I don't think. Um, Japan would say that we are not independent. But their reliance on the US through the security treaty is so strong that that tie is very difficult to undo. I mean, look at 54,000 US forces stationed in Japan throughout, 80% of them in a little tiny island in Okinawa. Um, so Japan's military you know, defense um, strategy is totally based on protection from the United, including, of course, the nuclear umbrella from, from Japan. So no matter what India wishes for Japan to become independent of the US, uh, that story will not change. But what Japan has done is to bring new narratives. So the disease narratives about the Indo-Pacific, about the Quad, new kinds of trilaterals, these are, I think, Japan's initiatives, which uh, we have seen uh, Japan taking leadership role. I mean, I'm not talking about CPTPP and RCEP and others where Japan has played equally important role. Uh, but just in relation to India, we can see that, or the Indian Ocean in particular, that uh, Japan has been able to do that. Um, coming to the question, of course, the emergence of China is a huge factor in that. We know it's, we cannot deny that. You know, even at the back of Abe's mind was China, and he, he, his assessment of India was, of course, his grandfather Kishi and others, his own conviction, but at the back of his head was China as a factor to um, have India as a, uh, as a friendly uh, country and deep engagement there. On the question of, you ask about does this, this asymmetry of interest, does this work for India? <laughs> I, I'd rather not answer that question because I leave it to Indian experts on that issue, whether that works for India. But what I understand, or what I can say that Japan feels threatened by China on a daily basis. If you look at uh, Japanese patrol boards, uh, sorry, Chinese patrol boards into the contagious waters in, around the Senkaku Islands, uh, if you look at the aircraft uh, hovering around Japanese uh, airspace and so on and so forth, so Japan is, is really feels very, very threatened. Um, and added to that, of course, is North Korea, you know, on a daily basis. Um, and so I think uh, that Japan is in a very, very difficult uh, position. Uh, so this question is also relates to the dependence on the US. I mean, Japan doesn't have nuclear capacity. Um, Japan's military is still for defensive purposes. Uh, they can't go on offensive, if, I mean, the Kishida government is talking about preemption, right? So preem preemptive strikes, but whether he really guesses through or not, we, we are not sure. But the court is here to stay, I'm sure. Um, and, uh, you know, Japan sees India as a great partner in that, not necessarily, um, you know, in, in military terms that India will, you can rely on India for any military purposes. Uh, but when in the, in the broader context of the Indian Ocean, um, here Japan sees a great, a greater role uh, for India. 
Um, your questions then, or oh, she has, has she gone? I, I think she has. Okay, that's, a, that's okay. I think the leadership role is, is, is very, very important. And she asked about uh, external circumstances. Um, my assessment of view is that is the domestic circumstances, external circumstances, and leadership. These three are combined together to produce some kind of policy outcomes in foreign policy. So for India and Japan, we have seen domestic circumstances. You know, India has been always very receptive to Japan. Uh, I remember in 1993, the magazine seminar, uh, iconic Indian <laughs> monthly, it has wooing Japan. That was the title. So India has been trying to woo mm. Japan for a very long period of time. But Japan uh, never paid much attention to that, as a matter of fact, until very recently. Um, so I think uh, leadership uh, role, we have seen how Abe turned things around. Things were happening even before Abe, but it really took off from there. And similarly, in India, circumstances change, economic opening of the economy and markets. Uh, Manmohan Singh had a good rapport with uh, Japanese leaders. Uh, there was a headline in the Hindu recently. Uh, it said that uh, Abe regarded Manmohan Singh as a mentor and Modi as a friend. So that tells a lot about it, how Abe was connected to both these uh, uh, leaders. So I think her point about leadership uh, is, is very, very valid. Uh, Ganesh, thank you, and welcome back. You, <laughs> you were away for some time. Um, I would add rather Delhi Metro, uh, because the Delhi Metro is funded by, uh, through Japanese ODA. That's the most visible uh, you know, infrastructure in Delhi. Uh, very few people know about it. There was some, you know, like a street survey about this issue. I saw some Japanese uh, YouTube footage. They asked 100 people. No one knew that this was funded by Japan. So the Japanese feel a bit frustrated about this thing. Oh, come on. Um, but your, your point about uh, this uh, firm level perception, you know, uh, JETRO, which is Japan External Trade Organization, they carry out survey on an annual basis, or so occasionally they do that. And if you look at their surveys of India, you know, most Japanese firms would say they have got positive, very positive image of India. The, the puzzle is they have got a very positive image of India, but they are not investing in India. Um, and uh, that, and that, that's something uh, we need to do micro-level analysis why. And you were right about Maruti, Suzuki, auto sector uh, became quite buoyant in India, including Toyota. Um, but if you look at the last five years, not many new companies have, have gone uh, to India. It partly, it reflects on Japanese economic slowdown, but the Japanese companies still have got a lot to invest overseas. Uh, so India is not their first uh, uh, place of choice. Uh, they, they, that's in their mind, but not their first place of choice. Um, you know, whatever engagement in India is happening, is happening also through Japan's ODA. Once Japan pumps money through its aid program, which is part of that is loans to India on a very, uh, you know, generous terms for 30, 40 years, 0.5% uh, you know, loan and repayment, very, very, so lots of Japanese companies get involved through these ODA projects. I give you an example, this bullet train project, JR East, which is a semi-private you know, company. They are involved with that. Frankly, they didn't want to get involved with that. But, but Abe's uh, personality, you know, he just pushed that uh, thing through. Um, so corporate, lots of corporations in India they engage in the market through ODA projects. Uh, so it's still, I think, there is a bit of, um, you know, from the past, this, this um, perception about India. But I must tell you one thing, fascinating. <laughs> Japanese companies have opened 
Japanese curry shops in, <laughs> in India. It's like selling eyes to Eskimos, <laughs> right? So there are, and I, somebody told me there's big queue in those. They, these are Japanese, <laughs> Japanese style curry shops. And so somebody is thinking very creatively. I mean, there are lots of other kinds of investment. Uniqlo has gone recently. Uh, so there are some retailers. Um, at some stage, you know, um, uh, the, uh, the big uh, telephone company, they wanted to be in India, and it didn't get, go, go through properly. You know, the Japanese entity was there for some time. Big company, tele Teleco, it didn't progress much. Yeah. So, so these are uh, some of the uh, questions that are, that are hanging there. Did I have something? No, well, only three of them. Okay. Yeah, only yeah, three. Okay. I think the reference to uh, Indian and Japanese curry reminds us that we are into lunch now. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, Professor Jane, for no, no, for your engaging no. session and for the good uh, and candid uh, discussion session that followed as well. And thank you all for staying. My apologies for having going having gone over time, but it was a good discussion. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Sorry. Please join okay, me to thank, thank Professor Jay. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Thanks for your Thank you very much.